Um, so sensory gardens is really about um, looking at all your senses. So we're going to be looking at um, sight, touch, taste, smell, um, and engaging all your senses. So I just want to turn one. So you all know me by now. Like, woo! Right. So, what is a sensory garden? We're going to talk about, like I said, sight, like hearing, taste, smell, touch, the sensory plants. And have you experienced a sensory garden? Has anyone been to what they think might be a sensory garden? Because that includes all those sorts of things. Yes. Yes. Where, where was that? Well, it was a while ago now, but I think it was up in the Ballarat Botanical Gardens. Right. There was a section there. Mm. And why did you think it was a sensory garden? Because they talked about the different textures of the plants and how you could shut the light and go around. There was and that and was yeah. basically the people with disabilities. Okay. Yeah. Right. You know, the Ballarat National Park. Yeah. 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 And did you feel different when you were in that space? Yeah. Yeah. It kind of. Kind of the atmosphere and, and things. Yeah. I really like. I think it was a really good idea. And yeah. There was a lot of thought put into it. Yeah. And it was nice to be able to go around and feel and be able to. Yeah. Have yeah. Have a look at the different types of soil and that. Yeah. It was only in a small space. Yeah. yeah. It had to be big. Yeah. I think there's also one at the Melbourne Botanical Gardens as well. They're starting to incorporate that sort of stuff. So I've got some list of gardens at the end of the talk that you can go and visit when we can. Go check it out a bit more. Have a look. Okay. So a sensory gardens. So I don't know if any of you heard of synesthesia. What is synesthesia? Have any of you heard of that word? It's in some people, it's where, say, when they hear music, they see colour, or um, when they taste something, it reminds them of a, of a word, or they have, they have cross, crossing of sensation in their brains, in their synapses. Um, a lot of artists have it. Um, I have a little bit of it. Like, I notice, like, when I'm at the traffic lights and the flashing lights, I hear noises. It's like a bit of a doof doof going on, even though there's no noise, I hear that. So the reason why synesthesia is interesting is because when we talk about sensory guards, we're talking about that crossing over of senses for our well-being to bring harmony um, and peacefulness to us and really create places that speak to us and we feel really comfortable there. We really love it. And sometimes you're going to a space and going, I like it here, but I'm not sure why. And it could be because it's it's a sensory guard that's interacting with you on a whole lot of sensory levels. So next time you have that experience, just sort of have a look around and see what's been planted and what the elements are and just have a, 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 a feeling about it and maybe take that back to your own gardens. So the whole point of you know, sensory gardens and garden design is to um, incorporate some of that thing, those things, elements into your own spaces and own gardens. Um, to make them really welcoming and your own places. Um, and yes, it does definitely, definitely enhance well-being. I mean, I think at the Talbot Royal uh, Hospital, they've set up a sensory garden for people recovering, you know, from illnesses and operations. If they can look out um, at some greenery or some nice shrubs and be some water, they actually, they've done studies and found that they recover faster. Because if you think about human beings, Evolutionary wise, we um, our ancestors grew up around nature. Nature was always part of us. We interact with nature. You know, we're not separate from it. We need to be part of it. So, um, but we're starting to realise that it's it's intrinsic. We need to uh, grow it into our lives and have it around us. I mean, you probably all know this because of gardeners. Okay. So they, they have done some studies. Now, does anyone recognise this place? Um, well, so it's with C. Yeah. Um, Cranbourne. Cranbourne. Cranbourne Botanical Gardens. Now, if you haven't had a chance to go out there, I really suggest you do. It's got a really strong Australiana design to it. There's a whole lot of native plants out there that you can go and see in situ see what the foliage is doing, the flowers. Um, and they've done some amazing things with red 
soil there. I think they've also now got um, other bandicoots or numbats that actually got a, a, a breeding colony there, so you can go see them. They're protected from the cats and the foxes. Um, but we were talking, I think last week, I was asking, you know, what's the native plants around this area? And we didn't really know. Places like Cranbourne would be able to start that educational process for you and help you and say these are the plants in your local area. But it's just a fantastic place to walk around. I really love it. And just the way it's landscaped and the, the sound of the, the eucalyptus trees and the way the sunlight hits the sort of the hills and it's it's a, a full-on sensory experience. And yes, it does make you have um, a better mood. You feel, you know, looking at something lovely, you feel a lot more relaxed, a lot more calm. Um, um, and walking around also makes you feel kind of calm. We know these things lower our blood pressure. So. <laughs> 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 totally friend. Um, yeah, and cleaner air. The interesting thing about cleaner air is, you know, trees are pumping out oxygen and we breathe it in, the carbon dioxide, and we're doing this cycle thing when we're, we're in the forest and around trees. Um, and they've shown studies about um, some of the big pine forests in Northern Europe, and they actually release this resin into the atmosphere, um, and it actually changes the weather. Yeah, it actually, tur turpentines it's called, it's a little droplet of oil that, you know, like when you smell pine, it smells quite fresh and you like it. Well, it, go it goes into the atmosphere in tiny little droplets, and because it's slightly heavier, it attracts the water to it, which then form clouds, which then rain on the forests. So um, there's a, sort of an intimate connection there. And when we go um, under trees and in forests, you are getting a lung full of really good air that's coming in. Also, if, you know, the volatile oils can be really good for you too. Um, in Japan, which is a nice little segue for a Kokodama, they have um, forest walking or um, forest bathing is what they call it. They're really big into nature in Japan and they actually um, encourage you to go into the forest and, and bathe in the oxygen you're getting and bathe in the, the scents and experiences of forests. And it would be great if we could take that, that idea when we go out to Gippsland or wherever it is, when we go out to our national parks, which are beautiful, and really just take it in, just take a moment to take these things in, because um, we have some spectacular places here in Australia, and we need to get out into them and just... Um, that bring ourselves a little bit into balance when we can, right? Okay. So the first one I want to talk about is sight. So this is our main sort of sensory perception that we use, um, and certainly artists have been aware of colour and sight for a very, very long time. Um, Monet, you know, with the water lilies, he used to go out and paint at different times of the day. So um, Van Gogh's to do the haystacks. And what they all what they were doing was they'd go out hour after hour and paint with one scene over and over again because they realised that the light was changing in the garden and creating new dynamics, new exciting shadows and highlights and creating different um, sensory experiences. So they were right into what's happening. Um, with colour. Uh, I've got Tim Story is a quite a famous um, you know, artist in St Albert as well, both are both Australian artists, and you can see how they're looking at colour and they're looking at um, you know, the big skies that we have, the purples, the eucalyptus, really getting into the colours. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, the Australian natives, you know, they're not very colourful, they're not, you know, they're not really in your face. But when you actually stop and look at them, and look at the shadings of the greys and the purples um, on the eucalyptuses and the different colours. When you when you actually look micro and look a bit into the details, it goes on and on and on and on. That's a really good thing for you to do too. It kind of brings you down, and calms you down. It's really nice. Um, but for our gardens, the interesting thing is, so a bit of a colour wheel. I don't know if any of you have ever sort of had a look at. Color wheels. Um, so they're a sort of a 
tempted to look at your primary colours, so you know your yellows, um, blues, and reds, and then you've got all your secondary colours that fit on the colour wheel. So when they're next to each other, they're quite harmonious. But when, say, you're putting a yellow flower next to a purple flower, you're creating quite an excitement and a dynamic sort of look to your garden. So you can actually manipulate this within your spaces to bring sort of interest into different parts of your garden. One of the ones I really like to do is uh, look at the light and shade in your garden throughout the day and see what's highlighted. Now in Australia, um, in the middle of the, the day, bright colours like your reds and yellows are really quite vibrant, which is opposite from um, Europe. So if you say, if you look at your, think your back door, what you look at in your garden, what's your main sort of um, site interest? Do you have some beautiful sort of red clistamins in the centre or red things that are going to hit that full sun, if that's where you have it, where it is. And then later in the afternoon, you have more of these pastel type colours. And in the late afternoon, these shimmer, these really glow intensely. People have been adding, for instance, grasses, like golden grasses, um, to places where they can get that low afternoon light. And I have to say at the moment, the autumn light, mm -hmm. If you go out, go for a walk, it's it's like it's like an apricot peachy kind of glow on everything. And that's I think that's why I'm finding the autumn leaves so attractive because they're like jewels, they're just mm. glowing. So how can we bring that into our garden so that we can sit wherever we are in our house or on our porch and just really enjoy the light interplay throughout our garden? So making the most of it manipulating spaces. So having the grasses maybe a bit further away when the afternoon light hits them, having your you know your reds and yellow display in the centre, perhaps keeping in mind that that's that's an Echium by Madeira, this one here, with deep blue, deep blue um, recedes a lot and can make your garden seem bigger. So like purples and blues, and I say to people who have you know really quite high fences, it's a good idea to paint your fence like a deep blue or purple so it recedes back and then maybe put a put a deep green climber on the front of it. So you're getting that sense of depth going on. For instance, in my garden when I step out the back, so what I see is I have some selvias, um, red selvias in the centre um, and then I have um, some euphorbias, I have silver swan, which is a cream colour euphorbia. I have that close to the porch as that low light hits it, it glows. And then I have my peach nectarine trees that are losing their leaves sort of in the foreground a bit, so the leaf, the kind of the pastel colours, as they, the leaves are dropping off, I'm seeing those with the afternoon light. So don't just think about your plants in terms of performance, you know, size, shape, also think about the colour. And the colour doesn't necessarily have to be flowers because the thing about flowers is they're um, ephemeral. They don't last. So you have to think about um, your foliage, what's your foliage, and different foliage types. You know, what interests you, what do you like. And don't forget as well, um, if you have a courtyard area, maybe some evening or afternoon, um, evening artificial lights, you want to put in solar lights, you can get those two just to light underneath and you get a whole different picture to your garden at night. Different things are highlighted, foliage shapes um, look different. You know, that can be another dimension you can add to your garden. All right, so it should be your special space and you can definitely use site to do that. Okay, hearing. Now hearing's a funny one because I think people kind of forget forget about the sounds of their garden. Does anyone have ideas of the sounds of their garden? The kind of things they hear in their garden? I'm not talking about traffic. <laughs> uh, so is it, this is the thing. Next time, go into your garden and see what you can hear. Like in my garden, I can hear honey eaters in the, in the uh, tree at the back. I can hear the, sort of the leaves starting to fall a bit. Um, I don't have a board feature, but it's something I definitely like to include. 
Um, now, water features are interesting because you have to think about what sound of water movement do you like. And it's very personal because <laughs> some people might like the bubbling sound or little streams or, you know, whatever it is, or little drips and that sort of thing, but water is definitely a calming influence. And we can get a whole lot of different types of water features these days. There's mobile ones, there's solar energy ones that you can get a little square and put it on your face and it just bubbles gently, that sort of stuff. So you don't even need to get an electrician in. You can cast it out those sorts of things. Um, the other thing that water will do will, will help the birds and the little insects as well. So you're providing them with a food source, um, a place where they can come and have a drink because a couple of years ago I was in a client's place, it was a very hot summer day, and she had a bit of a chook area, then a feeder with the water dripper, and all the bees were crowding around that water feeder because they had nowhere else to get any water. They were really thirsty. And as we know, the bees that fly around our garden they are the grandmother bees, they're the oldest bees in the hive. So if we can help them out, give them a little, little bit of water. Now for bees, it would just be a tiny basin. But for you, you might want to consider, you know, a, a feature that flows or bubbles or whatever you like. But it can um, hide some of the traffic noises or if you've got street noises as well, um, and bring in birds and bring in insects. Does anyone else have any ideas for hearing I mean, there's wind, wind chimes as well could be a nice one. Some people love them or hate them, depending on what they are. That could be a nice I one. I just found um, that putting up a couple of wind chimes, yeah. the birds coming in under the area roof. Okay. So, it's worth for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you want more birds in your garden, obviously you're going to have to provide that type of habitat. I mean, I've got honey eaters in my garden because they've got glistamine, they've got selvias going on. And they're now darting in and out. I've never seen them before. They're coming in because they're actually kind of settling in and getting, oh, I said, every day because they've got a food source, they've got a water source, they're quite happy. So if you want to bring some of the native birds in them, you know, you need to look at planting some of the food sources and shelter that they need. And certainly the little birds, you know, like those more dense type shrubs, but there's a whole lot of books on that. Um, but I think inviting them into your garden adds this whole other layer. It's a really, really lovely thing to do. Taste. So we've been, but through this whole series, we've been talking about the year of vegetables and all the great things, the herbs we've grown and all that sort of stuff. I mean, really, there's nothing better than growing your own in your garden. And as I said, you know, if you're a beginner to that sort of thing, just grow the things that you'd like, learn about how to grow um, maybe a few crops and give that a go. Um, it can also be good to try some veggies that aren't mainstream. And the really nice thing about this area, it's very multicultural. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, nationalities growing all sorts of interesting things. Um, I, a couple of years ago, I got some seeds for a fuzzy melon. Has anyone heard of a fuzzy melon? So they, they're like a vine, and they grow, they're like um, trombone zucchinis, but they're massive. And uh, I was giving some seeds. I'm not going to see how these go. I put them in the garden. And, Gee, they took off. But, um, and I was quite impressed with them. And then I know that around here there was a uh, like festival, and they had a vegetable competition. And so I took one of these things in, thinking, oh, my fuzzy melon must be the biggest ever. <laughs> and then I went in the water, right? Took it in. Nah, it's only a lot bigger. <laughs> but I thought, I don't want to take that home. And then this Vietnamese guy was like, oh, I love that. So please take it. <laughs> but it was nice, you know, like it was nice. I got to learn about his culture a bit. He got to um, take home the fuzzy melon. Um, and I got to try and grow something new and learn about how it was cooked and how it was prepared. Um, there's all sorts of things like, um, there's a weed called purslane, which you see in cracks and things. It's got, a, it's like a bit of a succulent looking mm -hmm. weed. Um, in, I think it's Italian, I'm not sure about Greek cultures, but they use it in salads. They eat it, you know, it's like a, it's, it's a nourishing food, but yet we see it as a weed. So um, I always think as gardeners, it's important to increase your knowledge and find out about the world of plants and, and you know, what people are doing with them because it's really interesting. It's just this is 
fascinating. Um, yeah, and just having your own veggie patch, whether that's a collection of pots or a little patch that you can grow something. I think it's lovely to see. Um, you know, like we grew a whole lot of broad beans last year. We were out there picking them and preparing them. Um, I know the community garden I spoke about, we're going to do some olive pressing, we're going to do that at a tree, you know. Like you can learn all these other skills and really experience different things. So I think growing some sort of veggies and herbs, like you're saying, you learn, learn all sorts of things. Um, like we were talking earlier about green lace wing that suddenly landed on the, the herbs you know, that you hadn't seen before, right? So it's, you're getting more dimension to your gardening knowledge. Knowledge is you're always learning. No matter what age you are, you should always be learning because if you know everything, your life is boring, right? There's always something to learn and something that people can offer, especially as gardeners, and we should share, okay? Good gardeners always share. Okay. Smell. So smell smells another interesting one. They, the scientists haven't quite worked out how to um, calculate smell. Like they can do it with sight and say like you're on this wavelength or whatever it is. But with, with smell, they can't really pin it down because everyone's sense of smell is so different and triggers different memories and different nostalgia. Um, and some people really like a particular smell and some people don't. Um, so, but bringing those sorts of things into your garden is, is a lovely thing. I know like um, growing up we had um, Lady Banks roses, the yellow roses that I really love, um, and I'd really like to bring those back into the garden. So I really have a bit of a, a cycle with my garden and bring those plants that I really love into it. And also placement is important. But like this one here is the wax leaf flower, that one there, and that's got a beautiful soft citrus scent, but it's a bit far away for me, I think, in my garden. I don't really get that sense of it. It's got little um, oil oil things on the ridges of the, the branches, and I want to bring that a bit closer. So those favourite scents a bit closer. This one's the peppermint geranium. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to grow that. It's not the most spectacular looking plant, so you rub those leaves and whoo, you get a hit of that peppermint, really strong peppermint for clearing out the sinuses, that sort of thing, and just calming things down. It's really lovely. Um, there's, a, there's a shop called Klein's on um, Brunswick, and they have a series of perfume that's really bizarre, and they have one that's Freshly cut grass. You can actually buy perfume with freshly cut grass. Some people love it, you know. And then they have like the, 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 like coffee. And then I think they have laundry. You can get a perfume oh. called laundry. <laughs> Obviously not the bad laundry, right? <laughs> <laughs> but who would have thought laundry? You know, it's just it's just very very interesting what people are into as far as the, the fragrances and things. And how can you bring those into your garden? Okay, touch. Um, so they have a, our sense of touch is so refined and so complex that the, the researchers haven't actually worked out how to replicate it in artificial intelligence. They, they can't do it yet because we're so, our fingertips, our skin is so sensitive and complex. It's called haptics, haptics. And the reason why the researchers want to get into that is you know like when you go to a shopping centre and you smell freshly fresh bread or the coffee or whatever and it's only like, oh, I've got to get off, go and get my coffee. We're all into it. The onions um, and sausages are fun. Onions, thank you. You know you've been manipulated, but you don't. Yeah. They're, they're trying to work out how we, we have the sense of touch that we have. Um, and I know that in the cinemas, they've been trying to add them to the chairs. So if you're going on a... Well, as IMAX experiences, they kind of, woo, you know, they move you around a bit, but they, they can't do it with our, with our skin yet. Our skin is so complex. Um, so I think if we take advantage of that and, and our the amazing bodies that we have, we can bring in some of these textures into our garden 
And it's really exciting when you can have a bit of a juxtaposition going. So maybe it's a rough bark with a smooth glass. Obviously, you don't want to do it with the cactuses. Um, but, you know, like, what do you like touching? I know, like, um, I was going to this client's place and they actually had one of those massive hedges and you just have to touch it as you go past because it's like a big furry creature. It's just, oh, you know, that sort of stuff. So can you bring that in? to your garden because, again, it's bringing an additional element into it. What do you like? Um, likewise, some people are really funny about certain touch things, like felt. I'm not so great with felt. I don't like it. I can't tell you why. can't tell you why, but it's that sensory thing. It's somehow a sandpaper. Ah, see, there you go. There you go. We all have those funny, funny, funny things, right, that you don't like touching. But the things that you do like touching, maybe smooth or some timber or, you know, the coldness of, of slate or tile or, um, you know, the warmth of a nice fern, those sorts of things can you bring them in. The only thing I'd say here is making sure that they are people friendly and pet friendly kind of plants um, when you're touching them so they're not poisonous or they're not going to give you any irritants as well. But I think that's part of that human experience as well. To use the sense of touch, um, how can we do it? Or even like if you've got the water coming through, it will help. It will help us, especially you now we're going into lockdown and you know we're going to be at home. How can we bring some of these calming, calming influences in? And this is definitely one of them. Okay, it's, it's really it's subconscious, all right. But you're in the know now, so you can actually manipulate this sort of stuff. Um, and bring in those lovely um, touches that you like. So here's just some sensory plant selections. This is by no means um, exhaustive. This is only a few. So I've spoken about the peppermint geranium, uh, the wax leaf flower. There's also the lemon scented Darwinia. So if any of you would go to Cranbourne, you'll see a lot of Darwinia up there. It's a beautiful little plant. Um, lavender roses, obviously. Um, and then we've got touch. Now, the lambs here, you know, the little ones and the fuzzy ones, some people hate them. Like, my partner hates it, can't stand the touch. And yeah, interesting, isn't it? Um, the daisies, glistening, it got very um, the rigid sort of leaves, but then the soft little stamens at the top. So they're really nice. That, that juxtaposition is really good. Um, and it's got a sort of herbs and vegetables, so bringing them in. And this is something that you should be combining. So where do you have gaps in your garden? So maybe you're really good on the herbs and veggies, but maybe you haven't got a water feature or you haven't got some interesting <coughs> sounding plants in your garden. What sound do your plants make? Maybe when the wind comes through them or the leaves and um, there's like, I know in America there's the quake and aspens, which, which shimmer in the wind and make a particular noise. And like the she oaks, the she oaks, casserinas, um, we have there. Yeah, now it's interesting with the casserinas, they have the needles on them. So the the wind as they're going through, I think it's a bit like a violin or something, like somehow it's manipulating the, the sound. Sometimes I love that sound, and sometimes it's really mournful. But it kind of, it's kind of, like it's quite lovely. So just working that out. Um, so I've got there, I've got bamboo, but we could have casserinas there. Uh, Love in the mist. That, that's a little flower that forms pods. And when it dries out, the pods rattle like a macarena, a little mini macarena. Um, Sight, so I've definitely put in the grasses there. Um, the scanthus, sinensius, that's a lovely sort of golden one. If you plant your grasses, plant them in clumps, so you get that lovely effect. Um, cotton lavender is a grey type little um, ground cover. And again, for that one, I'm thinking of drought tolerant as well because it's getting hotter. Um, and greys are really nice in the garden. They pick up that afternoon light. So when everything has gone, because we think of green, green is like your monochrome framing colour. So where are you bringing in your points of interest? And greys can be a really nice one to bring in. Um, yeah, so 
have a think about this and what are you missing? What can you bring in? Keeping in mind that you can't go against nature. We need to be like surfers and we need to surf with nature and not try to plant something that won't work in our climate. Um, so just working with your space, remembering where your aspect is, where your morning, afternoon um, sun is coming in. If you don't know, now's the perfect time. We've got seven days. Let's go out and look at our gardens. Let's just watch it. Like Van Gogh did for Monet, they just watched, watched, oh, that's interesting there. Yeah. Oh, no, that needs something there. Yeah. Or, oh, you know, like, slow down. We can have a bit of a slow down period. I can't wait here. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's some design tips to keep in mind. Um, it's important to have a plan. So, that's why I say go out and observe first. We need to do that as gardeners. And then work out placements of things. And don't be afraid to pull something out that isn't working as well. Um, enclosed spaces can have uh, a really intense, you can have an intense experience. This was in one of my clients' gardens and you just had this beautiful maple and that was the main feature. So if you have a more enclosed space, you have to consider the plant that you have or plants, they need to work twice as hard as everything else. In, on, on multi levels. So, you know, the maple's got beautiful, that beautiful weeping branches, it has a nice soft sound when the wind comes through, in autumn it has lovely colours, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, if you've got a small space, get something you really love, get a plant you really love, and, you know, use that and put that in. Um, again, you might want to overlay that with local plants, and that's why I'm suggesting going and finding out what's what works well, looking in your neighbour's gardens and seeing what's working well. Keeping in mind, nature is a tricky thing. And um, I was just seeing a client recently, she had a couple of citrus and she's like, this citrus isn't growing properly, all the rest look great, not this one. It could be because her soil is too wet, so it's waterlogged. She's also got potostrum, the neighbour's got potostrum, so that's a, probably a fair plant. <laughs> Um, there might be something in the soil. It might just be a weed species. You know, like there's there's a lot of things going on. So when people come to me and say like that, you know, this isn't doing well, I go through a series of <coughs> investigative questions to try and get a handle on it. And that's what you should do too. If something's not working, ask a series of questions. What's nearby? What pH is my soil? Is it dry or waterlogged? Uh, do I know what's been in it before? Is there something I'm growing nearby that I put a, um, a nutrient on that perhaps it doesn't like? You know, like, be, be an investigator. Um, also, plants, I think it's, we want to have plants really close to us at human scale. Um, some of the, you know, the nicest places in the world, um, I was just thinking, I <laughs> went past about Paris the other day and they kept all their buildings to like five stories and that's it. It's a human scale um, and all their parks are quite at that human scale. I remember a few years ago I went to New York and I don't know if any of you have been to New York but I remember walking up the subway and going, oh my God. And, the, you know, the skyscrapers are, it's just, you feel like an ant. It's not a very nice feeling. It's not good. You don't want to feel like really tiny. So with your with your plants, you want to have them, you know, just kind of comforting you, like a nice frame or arbor, and that's enough. Maybe you have one tree or two trees that are the, like the feature trees, but everything else is close by. You can really go in and experience it at a human scale. Um, if you perhaps got a bad back or there's someone with a wheelchair or whatever it is, um, does your garden cater for those people? Can they get around it easily? Um, I see a lot of people who, you know, um, are about to retire and they look at their gardens and like, this is this is not working for me because got, I've got too much in here. So simplifying your garden, making your paths easier to walk around. Gardens are constantly changing. So we should be thinking about the future and what we want to do with our gardens. That's, that's Completely normal to do that. Um, 
And again, how much maintenance you want to do. Maples are beautiful, but they lose all their leaves and then you've got to break them up. It's the same thing with <coughs> my nutrients and peaches. There's leaves everywhere. So what am I going to do? I'm going to make leaf compost. So I'm going to put them in a big bag and create my leaf compost, which is going to be great for my worms and things. But there is work in that. So if you're busy people, if you like to go out or whatever you're up to, you have to consider how much maintenance you want to do. There is no such thing as a no maintenance garden. It's a myth. All right, <laughs> no maintenance. That's called a concrete box, and we don't want to go there. All right, so how much maintenance are you prepared to do? And it should be something that is fun, like it's it's labour, but it's okay. Mm. It's on something you can handle. Like I've seen people, they're just like, this dress, I can't handle this. I'm just getting stressed, you know. Garden shouldn't be like that. They should be enjoyable, and you should be out there breathing and and doing all that stuff for the living. Yeah. Okay, so here are some sensory gardens around Melbourne. Um, obviously the Royal Botanical Gardens, there's lots to see there. They just had 175 year anniversary, the Royal Botanical Gardens. They had a bit of a celebration. Um, and I met a guy whose grandfather planted the first citrus in the Royal Botanical Gardens, so that was quite exciting. Um, so there's a lot going on there. Then, um, as I spoke about in Cranbourne, there's ones in Werribee as well, um, Janja, that's just further out, Ripon, Ripon Lee and Heronswood, they're the more traditional type gardens, more formal type gardens. Um, and then there's the Heidi Museum of Modern Art as well, if you've been up that way, mm -hmm. up to Bulleen, up there, there's a lovely little walk, you go through lovely rolling hills and um, we just have dairy farms and They've got a really beautiful herb patch up there if you really need your herbs. Um, so there's lots of places. That's only a few that you can visit around Melbourne. Um, but I think during these seven days, what we can do is that groundwork. So we can look at our gardens and watch it throughout the day and sort of start to make plans on what we would like to enhance, what we would like to change, you know, what could go on. You know, there's a lot we can do. And then when we come out, we can start to visit these places. Garden design and planning is not a quick thing. It's usually done in stages. Um, you know, I just saw a young couple out near me and um, we spoke about doing it in stages because they want to have a herb patch and a native garden and they had the most amazing kumquat tree I've ever seen. Um, but, you know, just how to deal with their garden at this point when they walk into a new space and how to make it friendly and something that they are proud of. But also remember, we are custodians of, of our gardens. All right, we don't, we don't really own our gardens because they'll go on to someone else, but while we're looking after them, you know, who do we invite into our gardens, the birds, the bees, and um, what life can we support, particularly with the bushfires? Um, and I know I've gone on about that before, but um, a garden, is a sensory garden. So one of the six senses I could have said was animals, you know, like how do we bring them in and provide a space for them to feel happy and, and they can shelter and breathe and all that sort of stuff. So, and a magic garden is so much more fun. It's really fun. Cool. So here's some really great books. Obviously, Joe's worked very hard and put some books over. No. Um, or we buy books from Joe, she knows where to go. Good, good. Um, the therapeutic gardens is great as well, so if you have anyone that's sick or um, you know, if you had a sickness yourself, it's really good to look at the therapeutic gardens, bringing those in. Um, this one's amazing, what plants know, I've read this one, it's all snippets from all around the world, um, what plants do. For instance, I think in this one, it talks about the acacia trees um, near the Kalahari Desert, and just a quick thing was they they noticed that the um, kudu, which are like antelope, were eating the um, acacia and getting really sick and dying, and they couldn't work out what it was. And what the acacias were doing, because they communicate, because plants communicate with each other, they talk to each other, not like we talk to each other, they actually talk through chemical interactions. Um, and what the, the scientists worked out was that the acacia, when it was being nibbled on, would 
release volatile chemicals into the air, which would drift over to the next acacia. That acacia would have warning warning signals going on in its chemical makeup and pump a particular like tea tree oil into its leaves. So when the do country that one, it would get sick as well. So and it would go down and down and down and down the line. Um, so they're actually communicating with each other uh, and trying to, to fight these animals that are attacking them or the pests or and that's just a small stuff of what plants do. Right? So books like this are really fascinating. Um, again, we've got some landscape urban design for health and well-being, which is really nice. And just getting into that sense of um, mind and you know what we can do to bring stuff in.